Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jan Chensky. I'm a senior uh, policy editor at Politico. And welcome back for the second edition of Politico Sustainable Future Summit. Uh, we're thrilled to have the opportunity to host this summit virtually. And today we've got uh, some top policymakers, uh, and we're going to be talking about some of the most pressing uh, issues related to sustainability in the EU and beyond. Um, I'd like to thank our speakers for agreeing to take part in today's panels, and also would like to thank the, uh, the sponsors who've made this uh, event possible. Our partners are Cefic, Syngenta, Tetra Pak, Sanofi, Unesda, and our supporting organizations, Halta L'Obsellence Programme and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Before we begin, I'd like to uh, mention a few housekeeping rules. Um, we try to make this event as interactive as possible. And so uh, if you have uh, questions, uh, please submit them via the SWAT card app. And we've also got polls on the, on the app. So uh, if you do take part in that, that does help make the, uh, the event much more, uh, much more interactive in these sort of Zoom times. You can also tweet about this event and the hashtag is political sustainability. Um, we also have some um, a reserve built in for possible technical problems. I'm actually doing this from Warsaw, but we do have a standby person in Brussels. So if there is any technical problems on our end, the event should uh, continue very smoothly. There should be no particular problem at all on that. Um, I'd like to kick off the second day of our Sustainable Future Summit by welcoming Kai Simpson, the EU Commissioner for, uh, for Energy for uh, the opening interview. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thanks very much for for agreeing to take part. Um, I thought that we'd begin with uh, with the thing that's sort of on the top of the agenda for uh, for the EU uh, this year, and that's the uh, the Green Deal. And uh, I was wondering if you'd be able to give us. Uh, I know you're a part of the the, the broader functioning of of the, of the Green Deal that that's that's working its way through right now. Can you give us a sense of what you see as the big political pinch points? Uh, of the Green Deal that we should sort of look out for in the next month as this project works its way through the various uh, European institutions? Yes, indeed. Uh, well, a year ago when we started uh, our work uh, under the guidance of Ursula von der Leyen, then uh, she announced um, as one of our top priorities uh, the Green Deal. And already then, last December before the COVID crisis, um, she announced it as a growth strategy. So um, I have the honor to be part of the so-called Green Deal cluster. And, uh, and this year we have um, presented several um, initiatives that are very important to achieve climate neutrality by 2050. So if, if I will just mention a few of them, then of course the climate law and, and also the Just Transition Fund, um, also climate target plan for 2030. And I myself and my team uh, we presented several strategies um, that, are, uh, that are necessary to achieve um, our 2030 goals um, and, um, and also 2050 target. Uh, these are uh, strategies that will lay out how our energy system will look like in the future. So energy system integration strategy and hydrogen strategy, and also offshore renewable strategy, methane emissions, um, and, and of course, renovation wave. And now if we are looking uh, forward, uh, in the near future, I see three important moments. Uh, first, the European Council. We need an agreement on the 2030 targets. Um, and, um, and then this will allow us um, to update um, the national um, targets too. Second, um, by the mid-April, we expect that member states uh, will present their final national recovery and resilience plans. Um, and um, by doing so, they will dedicate 37% of the expenditure um, to the climate and energy investments. So um, this um, helps us to front load um, several investments, several uh, uh, necessary projects so that were uh, planned already under the national energy climate plans, but, uh, but now indeed we need to front load them. And finally, the third uh, important step is um, planned in June, um, when the Commission will present um, a Fit for 55 package, uh, which will cover everything from uh, renewables to energy efficiency, um, also modernization of ETS framework and uh, extension 
it to new sectors and uh, and as well as lucf and energy taxation and efforts sharing so wide range of uh, different legislative uh, proposals and uh, and uh, and also i didn't mention carbon border adjustment mechanism but well um, this is important so that we can motivate our trade partners to follow our um, steps so lots of uh, lots of uh, initiatives uh, in 2021 too on the on the political side of things, I mean, this is something that we we do write a lot about, and I'm sure you're, you're sort of uh, very aware of that agenda as well. Is that some of these uh, these issues are particularly problematic for the higher carbon countries, uh, which have been uh, both skeptical about the about the uh, the increased uh, 2030 target, the, the going up to 55 percent. Uh, the Czechs, the Poles, the other countries uh, want a, 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 to be a, to be assured that that the that they can hand that there's going to be some sort of mechanism to deal with the costs that they're going to incur for for this kind of a, a transition, and then more broadly for the 2050 target, obviously the Poles are the ones who have still not agreed to it for uh, for uh, their own uh, internal domestic target. How do you finesse the politics of that? How do you? What are you doing to persuade those those reluctant countries that this is something that they should sign up to? Well, um, first of all, every member state they have a right to choose their energy mix. And if we are talking about climate neutrality, then some of the member states have announced that they are not uh, uh, planning to achieve it. Um, the scenario one hundred percent renewables, but they uh, they will uh, also rely on uh, nuclear uh, capacities. Um, but uh, broader, broader view is that we know that uh, the impact of the transition uh, will be uneven um, between member states, uh, but also between regions. Uh, there are some regions uh, that have um, for decades um, been, um, well, well, been either regions for coal mining, uh, also lignite or peat, and or they are industrial regions uh, where transition will be um, will be costly. And to help them, uh, we have proposed um, exactly this uh, just transition mechanism, um, including the just transition fund. Um, so we plan. Well, this is a, a new thing, despite the fact that it is built on um, on the coal regions in transition project. And overall, um, we expect about one hundred billion euros of investments to be triggered by the just transition mechanism, just to ease the impact of the transition. Um, and, uh, and the plan is spelled that... For um, those countries? That, 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 does that need to be clearly spelled out for those countries, that they need to be able to sort of to take those promises to the bank, that they can go back to their people and say, this is not a nebulous promise, but this is concretely, this is how much we're going to get So to, to, to make this program sellable politically. Absolutely. And to use those uh, funds, um, member states, uh, together with uh, specific regions, they have to help uh, um, create just transition plans. So there has to be a, a clear vision how they will spend the money. Will they um, change uh, the installations in the uh, industrial um, 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 sectors or will they create new uh, industrial jobs so that are just polluting less? Um, so um, right now we do expect that member states along with the national, uh, with the regional uh, governments are already preparing those just transition uh, plans. This, um, this transition broadly, what we're talking about, both sustainability and the, and the Green Deal agenda, uh, implies vast changes to our everyday lives. I mean, it changes uh, how we drive, how we heat our homes, whether our homes are insulated, where we work, how we get to work, how we commute, basically every aspect of our life. Um, in, in your home country, in Estonia, what are some of the big changes that you think will have to take place in order to meet these sustainability and, and Green Deal goals? What are the big sort of issues that are, that are, that are prominent there? Well, in Estonia, the current uh, existing 2030 energy plan uh, predicts that Estonia will cut uh, greenhouse gas, uh, uh, it, it will be reduced uh, by 70%. So, um, so um, the 2030 uh, target is, uh, is uh, not very difficult to achieve, um, but um, 
But of course, additional financing uh, helps uh, us to do even more. And well, because Estonia is a um, uh, country with cold winters, then you don't have to convince people and businesses that, that energy efficiency of buildings is a very important thing. Um, actually, when we have had um, um, calls for grants for renovating buildings, they are oversubscribed by uh, eager housing communities uh, within the first 15 minutes. So um, one thing that is indeed popular uh, in Estonia is uh, renovating um, old building stock. Well, lots of them are um, dated back to 70s and 80s. And, and after the renovation, the heating bill might be uh, even half as, uh, as it was earlier. And, and of course, um, because Estonia land-wise is as big as Netherlands, but there are only 1.5 million inhabitants, then um, they have managed to phase out um, natural gas, and they don't use coal, imported coal, um, and they have replaced in heating um, the solid biomass. Um, that also brought down the costs. But there is also a problem. Estonia is producing uh, electricity out of oil shale. This is... Um, uh, produced in one specific region called Itaviruma, next to the Russian border. Uh, there are thousands of jobs and even more households who are dependent on this sector. And, and um, all the funds from Just Transition Fund that are dedicated for Estonia are going to this region because, uh, because um, there might be a... a um, mm, a problem if uh, if uh, new new jobs will not be created, uh, but in this regard, um, per capita, Estonia is one of the biggest beneficiaries. Um, uh, the Just Transition Fund will give uh, Estonia additional opportunities, and of course, renewables are doing uh, pretty pretty well in Estonia. There is a solar boom because of the um, support scheme that the government proposed. And uh, just this year, Estonia and Latvia announced uh, the plan to build a new uh, first offshore wind farm in Baltics. So, um, so the ways how to replace uh, fossil electricity with uh, renewables are there. Thanks very much. Um, you did mention the, uh, the, the carbon border mechanism and, uh, and the Relationship that the EU has to have with its with its partners on these on this issue. Um, I'm assuming that the election of Joe Biden changes the calculation slightly because there were big fears uh, under a Trump administration that setting up any sort of a mechanism like that would uh, would lead to retaliation and possibly cause a trade war. Um, are you already reaching out to the Biden administration? Are you do you have a sense that that uh, that this kind of a, a measure is now more acceptable, and are you moving forward on that? Actually, just yesterday, European, uh, well, well, uh, me, us at the college, uh, we uh, we discussed uh, the uh, the EU US relations, and uh, and in broader uh, sense, well, um, international cooperation is uh, very important because uh, EU is only responsible for nine percent of the greenhouse gas emissions globally. And uh, climate change is a global challenge, so, so it re requires global uh, response. And uh, and um, we do hope that uh, that um, United States uh, will stay a very good partner in this regard. This year, we witnessed that uh, several uh, several countries like uh, Japan, China, South Korea announced their dates for climate neutrality. And if um, U.S. makes a similar commitment then we know that about um, two thirds of the global economy and more than a half of the world's emissions would be covered. So, uh, so we are hopeful and uh, regarding the US, um, us at the European Commission, we just uh, yesterday adopted a uh, communication which uh, sets um, out our agenda for um, restarting transatlantic relations. But I have to uh, tell you that, um, that uh, cooperation um, in the energy sector, in the energy field, has been good over the past year. So even if our views on uh, climate change uh, were different, 
energy cooperation represented a, a positive agenda. Well, we covered the energy security and infrastructure and nuclear safety. And, uh, and now with Biden administration, there is a needed opportunity to create a broader partnership on climate change and extend our work on, uh, on um, other fields like renewables, um, storage, and methane emissions. So um, definitely after the president has uh, met um, her counterpart, the um, um, sectorial meetings will take place too, and the Energy Council is one of those. Um, you mentioned uh, methane emissions, and that's uh, certainly a uh, uh, an interesting thing when it comes to the uh, American LNG exports. There's been a couple of European contracts which have been called off uh, for for buying uh, American uh, liquefied natural gas because of worries about high uh, methane emissions. Uh, do you see that as an uh, as an ongoing issue that that the uh, that, that Europe simply Cannot afford to uh, to import uh, natural gas that comes from fracked sources, and more broadly, uh, what role do you see natural gas as playing in uh, the EU's energy picture uh, going forward? Well, um, right now, uh, the natural gas is second biggest uh, source um, after oil in the EU energy mix, and we expect that natural gas uh, will play a significant part during our transition period. Um, so in mid-term, it helps us to um, phase out more polluting fossil fuels. Uh, several member states have already announced uh, the phase-out dates for coal or lignite. And in short and medium term, the fastest way to replace these uh, fossil fuels is um, to replace them with natural gas. But of course, um, if we want to become climate neutral by 2050, then um, this natural gas will increasingly be replaced by renewable and low carbon gases like biomethane and, and clean hydrogen, uh, also um, synthetic gases. Um, and and um, coming back to your question about uh, LNG, then because of the gas um, crisis a, dec a decade ago, um, Commission has um, promoted diversification of gas supplies. So we have built um, and invested a lot into the gas interconnectors. Um, some of them are still uh, under construction, but uh, mainly eastern part of EU needed um, additional uh, connections. Poland, Lithuania, Baltic Pipe. Uh, um, Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, Austria, interconnector, and also Baltic connector. But um, LNG terminals added another um, source of supply, and uh, by doing so, um, also the share of LNG that comes from the United States has grown significantly. Um, we just adopted uh, our strategy on methane emissions because uh, methane is a very potent uh, greenhouse gas. It is second uh, after the CO2 when it comes to the contribution to climate change. And our strategy, strategy looks not only on the energy side, but also agriculture and waste management, um, because uh, most, well, then we cover most of the man-made uh, methane emissions. And, and uh, we know that uh, oil and gas production, um, production and transport, are areas where um, over half of methane emissions um, can be reduced at near net zero cost. And, um, and of course, we will come up with legis legislation next year so that uh, at first we will improve um, monitoring and, and leak detection. Um, and there is already the first step done also um, of this new strategy. 62 uh, companies that cover 30% of the world's um, oil and gas production, they have joined um, Oil and Gas Methane Partnership 2.0. And uh, this is a new standard of reporting methane emissions. And of course, we are working um, towards um, 
this that uh, all the companies who are exporters um, or who are our partners um, would like to join this uh, this partnership, this oil and gas methane partnership. I noticed that when you were talking about the uh, the various connectors that are that are under construction, you didn't mention Nord Stream two. Um, what is the uh, commission's position on whether this project should be completed, and what uh, what uh, relevance or uh, it has for uh, the EU's uh, energy picture and energy security? Well, I didn't uh, mention uh, Nord Stream 2 because uh, it is not a project of common interest, uh, common European interest. Um, but the um, com Commission's uh, objective has always been um, to ensure that if built, Nord Stream 2 um, has to operate in a transparent and non discriminatory way um, and within. Uh, um, our regulatory oversight um, it has to be um, in line with uh, our key principles um, uh, amended gas directive so um, and under international and eu energy law so um, as you know implementing uh, the eu's energy policy is a matter of eu um, and our member states, and uh, and since this gas directive was amended 2019, um, we have rules in place. Um, in um, in particular, well, Germany has uh, notified complete uh, transposition um, of these rules, and this is relevant for Nord Stream two. So, um, I think that um, as a matter of principle, Europe is. Um, Europe is responsible for um, safeguarding our own energy policy, and um, and um, and well, we have to well, along with our member states, um, secure that uh, all the interconnectors that are coming to Europe from third countries um, will be in line with our um, directives. In this case, the Mediterranean Directive. Uh, I noticed that you uh, you very carefully used the uh, the phrase "if built" for uh, for the pipeline, which is probably not the most reassuring message to uh, to Gazprom. And um, we have one question that's come in uh, from Blaise Langen, who asks: uh, uh, Renewable energies are often intermittent and have uh, big geographical advantages advantages or disadvantages. What are the EU plans to stabilize energy production across the union? Indeed, um, we already know what our member states are planning um, according to the current targets, because uh, first time ever we have this unique um, tool called the National Energy and Climate Plan. And, uh, and in this regard, um, there are different uh, ambition levels among member states, but all of them are doing something. Um, of course, um, if we want to achieve our 2050 targets, we know that uh, we need double the amount of electricity than we do have right now. This must be renewable. And, uh, and in this regard, we see based opportunity in, in offshore energy. Um, and uh, this is even opportunity for landlocked countries because um, this is industry and in some well countries that don't have um, seaside themselves, uh, they still have industry that uh, provides um, necessary uh, equipment for um, offshore wind parks, for example. Um, and in this regard, of course, uh, hydrogen will help us um, because uh, it helps us um, to to uh, cover those um, areas where electrification is not um, not possible or feasible. Or it's um, just too expensive. I'd like to actually, uh, if you could maybe stay a little bit on hydrogen, because that does seem to be sort of the flavor of the month. Everybody's doing hydrogen initiatives. There's uh, a lot of companies, a lot of interest uh, in in hydrogen. Um, 
some skeptics say that the, that you know that the technology uh, of electrolyzers and the cost picture is still not there for uh, for green hydrogen, and that it's uh, that it's not a certain bet that the that the prices will drop low enough to actually make this a, a viable alternative fuel. What role does hydrogen really play? Why do we need to have that as, as part of uh, Europe's uh, energy future? Well, as I, as I was uh, mentioning just earlier, well, um, um, hydrogen definitely has a potential to become a new clean energy <coughs> carrier in its own right. So right now it's mainly used as feedstock and uh, it comes mainly from uh, natural gas. Um, but in, in the future, uh, we want to step up um, renewable hydrogen production. And of course, um, we need to scale up um, its uh, use. So for well existing uh, hydrogen market, we need both scaling up production and also consumption. And, um, and at the same time, we should also decarbonize existing hydrogen production. So replace uh, gray hydrogen with renewables or low carbon hydrogen. And, and uh, the hydrogen strategy that we adopted in July um, lays uh, a vision for short-term, medium-term, and long-term uh, targets. Um, and research and innovation are supporting the scaling up of electrolyzers. Um, innovation fund um, in this regard also helps uh, the industry. And, uh, and from um, my point of view, we are also starting to develop the legislative framework for a European clean hydrogen market. And uh, then 10 e regulation will be the first step to plan a future hydrogen grid and um, to develop those uh, projects. Um, and uh, and we, we will propose this um, 10 year revision, revision later this uh, year, before the year ends. Uh, and of course, we are working on the certification and standards for renewable and low carbon hydrogen um, so that they will be traded transparently. So at first it needs financial support, but we predict that by 2030, um, um, green hydrogen will be uh, competitive with clay. Um, there's various national hydrogen plans out there. The French uh, plan to use some of their nuclear power to generate uh, clean hydrogen. Germany was talking about uh, potentially uh, using uh, shifting some production to North Africa. Um, do you think that there's a danger that, uh, or a perspective, I guess, that the uh, that the EU, as it shifts towards uh, a greener energy future? will become reliant on foreign technology and foreign suppliers, whether it's North Africa for uh, part of its hydrogen production, uh, China for rare earth production, which are, which are crucial to various renewable energy technologies, maybe China for solar energy uh, panels as well. Is, there a, uh, is Europe essentially shifting one dependency where it depends well, um, there is a great interest um, towards hydrogen, and several member states have adopted uh, their hydrogen strategies already, or uh, some are uh, well soon will do so. And we know that um, some member states, indeed, they do predict that they, their consumption needs will be higher than um, they can produce themselves. Um, well, to scale up the market, we also uh, launched a clean hydrogen alliance along with Thierry Breton and well, the interest both from industry and uh, academia and NGOs has been uh, huge. But part of our hydrogen strategy was also international cooperation uh, because right now we know that um, majority of our energy consumption um, will be covered with um, import. And, uh, and if we will we'll, um, phase out natural gas and uh, oil, and if it will be replaced with, um, some cases, electricity that is locally produced, but or, or even with hydrogen, but still our balance will be significantly different. Um, well, climate target plan told us that if we will 
achieve our climate neutrality by 2050, then we, um, we will save on EU fossil fuels energy bill um, in the period 2021, 2030, 1 billion euros and, um, and by the 2050, 3 trillion euros. So um, if some of the oil consumption will be replaced with green hydrogen that is produced in our close neighborhoods, uh, then uh, it does no harm right now. We are witnessing very volatile oil market results. And, and it gives us a great opportunity for our cooperation projects because um, Ukraine, Northern uh, Africa, they have uh, wonderful uh, climate conditions to produce uh, green hydrogen uh, out of the uh, uh, well, solar, solar energy. And, uh, and uh, from our point of view, we do have technological uh, leadership there, so we can, uh, we can uh, electrolyze wise um, help them. Thank you very much, Kadri. Um, just in case you're wondering why Diana suddenly turned into a woman, um, my name is Kalina Roshakov. I'm a climate reporter for Political Europe, and I'm just stepping in while we're um, trying to get Jan back on, on the screen for more. So thanks so much for, for already outlining some of the hydrogen uh, possibilities, opportunities, and challenges. However, you've mostly spoken about green hydrogen, and of course, the big battle raging in Brussels and beyond is what role for gas-based hydrogen um, so do you see an, a role for gas by hydrogen, first of all, and then also what role for gas more generally in the coming years? Good morning, Kalina. Nice to see you. Um, um, well, um, right now, um, in the existing hydrogen market, uh, the majority of the hydrogen, um, according to the latest data, more than 96% uh, is coming from natural gas. Um, so, if we want to scale up the consumption, we need to produce um, low carbon hydrogen. Um, and finally, um, we do predict that by 2030, um, price wise, uh, low carbon uh, hydrogen will be competitive. So far, we have to incentivize it. Um, and of course, we need to scale up the production of uh, renewable electricity, otherwise, um, mm, the demand will not be covered by our own resources. Um, natural gas plays a role uh, during transition. Um, if we are looking at our fulfilled 2020 targets, then uh, at the electricity sector, um, we have achieved a lot, mainly because some of the member states have phased out uh, coal uh, power generation and replacing it uh, with natural gas. It has been an uh, um, ongoing process. There are some uh, member states who are still planning to do so. And, uh, and if we're talking about uh, our 2050 targets, then of course, um, gas uh, market has to be decarbonized. Thank you very much. Welcome back. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, a little bit of a uh, bit of technical problems. I knew that this sort of thing was going to happen. This was the the coronavirus uh, the issues. Um, I wanted to uh, to also ask um, about the. Uh, I, I understand that Kalina asked you about the offshore strategy. No, no, we were still ah, talking great. about gas. Fantastic. Could you outline uh, sort of the key points of the uh, of the offshore strategy? And again, what role that plays in uh, in uh, in changing the uh, the EU's energy picture? Yes, indeed. Well, before we lost you, and I was mentioning that um, also in in the, in the hydrogen market, well, we do have um, technological uh, advantages here. But if we're talking about offshore, then this is uh, the field where Europe holds real global leadership. So um, eight out of um, 10 top global exporters of wind turbines are in EU countries. And, uh, and this is a very good example of how um, IGA became a um, market ready solution. So before the lockdown uh, came in, I had a chance to visit Denmark uh, this year. And I visited Esbjerg port, harbor, 
Um, and, and this is the region where exactly 30 years ago, offshore, first offshore wind park was built. And, uh, and now it is a um, technological success story. Um, that shows us um, how within 30 years, idea can become a, a market ready solution. And, um, and um, mm, considering 2050 targets, uh, we know that most of the energy has to come from renewable sources. We need to ramp up the production and, uh, and um, well, best spots on land, um, they tend to be taken already. So offshore energy is a um, way where we can scale up fast. Of course, we have to keep in mind that there are other sectors too who are older, fishing and shipping and, uh, and tourism and defense. But uh, this was part of our offshore strategy, how to well uh, create the environment for multi-use of this marine um, space. And, and uh, from my responsibility, how we can plan those parks so that uh, they will have good grid connections how, how we can encourage member states to cooperate. Um, there are first uh, pilot projects, but um, well, in uh, in the longer run, we need um, uh, we need um, common projects and so-called energy islands. Um, we actually did a story uh, a few weeks ago looking at uh, the individual examples of somebody who started as a as a fisherman transitioned to an oil and gas worker and is now training people to uh, to work on offshore wind farms. So there's sort of a, a personal story there as well as people have to adapt their lives to this, uh, to this these sort of changing uh, energy uh, p uh, pictures as well. So I'd like the, the, the final question, um, how has being involved in, uh, in this uh, Green Deal and the energy transition changed you personally? Do you fly less do you eat different foods do you do you in your everyday life has something changed because of what you deal with on on energy and, and climate issues well um i have heard uh, lots of interesting facts what a private person can do so that we will save energy and um, one fun fact is that if we are not um well, if we will store our photos, not in our phone and cloud, but we will store them in other ways, then uh, energy consumption will be smaller. If we don't send so many food pictures to our friends, then, uh, then uh, some nuclear power plants are not necessary. And, and of course, I'm flying significantly less because um, it's impossible to fly now. My days are in front of Kiwi set. Um, that allows me to meet uh, counterparts um, all across the world. It wasn't possible um, when the meetings still took place at physical format. Great. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for taking part uh, in our panel today. Um, and I would like uh, to invite everybody to join me uh, in 10 minutes time. Uh, and I'll be here to conduct an interview with uh, João Pedro Matos Fernandes, who's uh, Portugal's uh, Energy and Climate Action Minister. Uh, in the meantime, please explore the Summit app and book meetings with your peers, and we'll be back in just a few minutes' time. Thank you very much. <laughs>